Hi, I'm Caleb Giddings from Gun Nuts Media, and today I've taken leave of my senses and have decided to do a video about handgun terminal ballistics or handgun stopping power. This video may be a little long, but hopefully today we'll be able to dispel some of the myths and misunderstandings that so many people have, especially people on YouTube have, about how handguns work when they're fired at people. The first thing that we need to get out of the way is we need to understand exactly how handguns wound, okay? So, to make this very simple and very clear, handguns can only wound by actually touching or damaging tissue, all right? That's it, all right? Handguns will not hurt tissue that the handgun bullet does not touch. It's not possible. Now I know a lot of you are thinking, what about hydrostatic shock? Well, let me explain what hydrostatic shock is because there is a misunderstanding of how it works and what it is. Humans are made up largely of water. Most of our tissue is full of water and it's very elastic. When you're dealing with rifle calibers, which are fired at tremendous velocities, the rifle bullet enters, it does all kinds of fun things because of this tremendous velocity it's at. One of these things is called hydrostatic shock, where the speed and the energy of the rifle bullet actually causes the tissue around it to expand out of the way because water is not compressible. It pushes that water out of the way and actually pushes it out so rapidly and so quickly that it creates damage to the tissue. This is a function primarily of bullet velocity. Handguns, no handgun in a commercial chambering possesses sufficient velocity to induce hydrostatic shock, all right? Nine millimeters don't, 357 magnums don't, 45 ACPs don't. What people think they're seeing when they look at those temporary wound cavities in gel or in uh, clay or things like that, what that is is because the gel or the clay is not elastic like tissue, it leaves this temporary cavity expanded. In a human being, that stretches out and closes back up when it's hit by a pistol. So the first and most important thing that we can understand is that handguns can only damage tissue that they actually touch. Now that we have that out of the way, we need to look at the next steps of understanding handgun wounding mechanics. Step one, the most important thing in handgun wounding mechanics is shot placement. Shot placement, all right? When we think about shooting at a human being in self-defense, a lot of us have been spoiled by the targets that we buy at the range, whether it's an 8-inch IDPA circle or the enormous A zone of a USPSA target or a B27, which puts the bullseye somewhere around here in the abdomen. We've been spoiled by these very large target zones. The actual reality of this situation is that the target zone that you're looking for, if you are shooting a human being, in personal defense, whether as a member of the military, a private citizen, or a law enforcement officer, is about the size of my fist. It's not much bigger than that, all right? We are looking to target the heart or the aortic arch. These are the only major structures in the chest which will cause rapid incapacitation via blood loss, all right? Lung shots are not proven to stop people rapidly, even when you hit both lungs. Okay, the most important thing that you can hit in a human being is the heart or the aortic arch, not counting, of course, the central nervous system, all right? So now let's talk about the central nervous system. Where is that? Well, it's way back here, all right? So if I'm shooting somebody from a dead-on frontal shot, it's got to go through the breastbone, through all of the stuff that's in between the breastbone, and get all the way back to the spinal column, with enough velocity to actually disrupt the spinal column. Obviously, there are some better access points for shots to the central nervous system, such as the neck or, of course, the ocular box. But again, if you look at the size of these target zones, so here's where I want to shoot a person if I'm trying to disrupt their aortic arch. Here's where I want to shoot a person if I'm trying to disrupt their central nervous system. So, you know, 
It's about the width of my pen, which is about four inches wide, or the width of my hand, which is also about four inches wide. As a matter of fact, there is a very compelling argument that if you want to practice realistic defensive shooting, you should be trying to hit a four inch target on command. That would be a reasonable standard if you wanna practice supremely accurate defensive shooting. So understanding that the two areas that we need to hit are not very big, that's why shot placement is the most important thing when it comes to handgun wounding mechanics because I can shoot you 17 times in lower peripheral areas that won't necessarily damage you in a meaningful way that won't cause significant rapid blood loss, all right? The only way is that people get turned off, significant rapid blood loss, and turning off their computer. That's why these target zones are very small, and that's why shot placement is the most important part of handgun wounding mechanics. The second most important part of handgun wounding mechanics is penetration. You noticed that when I was talking about getting to these major organs, getting to the spine, getting to the brain, that sort of stuff, you have to go through a lot of things. I am not a super, I'm not a big dude, right? I'm not overweight or anything like that. I'm not, you know, a giant bodybuilder. But if you wanna shoot me in the heart, okay? You've gotta go through my breastbone, you've gotta go through the muscles, through all of this tissue, because my heart is a lot closer to my spine than most people realize. Most people don't realize the heart is actually way, it's set way back here in the chest, to protect it from stuff. Weird, right? It's almost like your body is designed to protect this incredibly important organ. So, the heart's way back in there. Penetration. The bullet must penetrate deep enough to reach these major blood-bearing organs, to reach important structures, like the heart, like the spinal column. If you shoot someone in the head, it's got to go through bones and stuff in their head, in their face, to get back to the brain, which is the part that we actually want to turn off. So if you are selecting a defensive round and it does not penetrate enough, you need to select a round that penetrates deeper. This is where we get into ballistic gel and that sort of stuff, which we're going to get to in a minute. But if you only take two things away from this video, take away that shot placement is the most important and penetration is the second most important and everything else is just angels dancing on the head of a pin, which we're about to get into now. To help make this more clear and to understand why frequently caliber doesn't matter that much, we're going to use a piece of bread. Why are we using a piece of bread? Well, it's a fairly elastic structure. It's mostly made up out of water. And I want you guys to get an idea of what I'm talking about when I say that handguns only hurt stuff by disrupting it, all right? So I've got a 22 Magnum around here. I'm just gonna poke it through this bread. Dee, 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 dee. Just like that. That's the hole. It's barely even there, okay? Up next, a nine mil. We're gonna poke it through the bread. There you go. There's your exit wound for the 9 mil. You notice how the elasticity of the bread is bringing it back together. It's helping it come back together and it's making that hole not nearly as big as people thought. People are kind of like that too. All right, here's a 357 Magnum snap cap that I have. Push this through. And I'm pulling these, the entire cases through on these as well. Here's your 357 Magnum hole, your mighty 357 Magnum. And last but not least, I'm gonna push a 40 through here. Actually, this won't be last. There's gonna be one more after the 40. So, 40 made a pretty good size hole, but it's not really that much bigger than the 357 or the nine mil, because you have to take into account if, push this nine mil through here again, so there's your nine mil hole, there's your 40 hole. You have to understand that these holes in terms of actual diameter aren't that much bigger than each other, okay? The diameter of that 357 round is 0.357 inches. The diameter of that 40 Smith & Wesson round is 0 0.40 inches, all right? You're talking about a difference of less than five hundredths of an inch. 
That is not a considerable difference. Now, I'm gonna do one more thing that I hadn't initially planned, but I just wanna give you guys an idea as to why shotgun slugs are so effective at making people stop doing stuff. So if your handguns punched little itty bitty holes through this thing, a shotgun round, oh, I'm trying to tear that evenly, there it goes, puts a kind of noticeable hole in it, all right? There you go. If you really want stopping power, use a shotgun. Now I get it, bread is not people, and we're gonna get into that. I wanted to do this to give you guys an idea of what happens with handgun wounding mechanics. All it's doing is pushing these little bits of bread or little bits of people out of the way. It crushes that tissue, it moves it out of the way, but it doesn't do anything beyond that. Now the other reason this is important is, as you see, there's not much of a difference in the size between your 357s or your 9 mils or your 40s or even a 45, which I don't have. Why this is important is when you understand what modern handgun ammunition is designed to do. So, if you have a modern defensive handgun round, whether it's a 357 Magnum or a 40 Smith & Wesson or a 9 millimeter or a 45 ACP, they are all going to do exactly the same thing. They're all going to expand to approximately 0 0.5, 0 0.55, maybe 0 0.6 inches, all right? They're all the same size now. So if they're all the same size, what's the difference? All right, now that we understand how handguns wound, we understand that they merely crush tissue, they don't cause hydrostatic shock or anything like that, we're going to look at why we use the rounds that we use and why we use the testing protocol that we use for handgun rounds. Now I'm sure you've seen YouTube videos of people who are not ballistics experts, who don't have any formal training in this field, doing things like shooting racks of ribs or pigs or stuff like that and claiming to be able to draw results from that. The reason that that stuff doesn't matter and why you cannot trust those results is it's not scientific and it's not repeatable, okay? Let me give you an example. Let's say I want to test the penetration of a nine millimeter versus a 357 Magnum on pigs. No two pigs are exactly the same, all right? You can't control for those variables. So I could get six pig heads and I could shoot three pig heads with one nine millimeter round and three pig heads with a 357 round one shot each, okay? The results that I'm going to glean from that aren't going to be statistically significant, nor are they going to be repeatable or scientific because each of these pig heads is different. No two pig heads are exactly alike. Yes, they have similar bone density and may have similar structures, but the results are not repeatable and they're not scientific. You can gain anecdotal data from that, anecdotal information, but what you're getting from this is not going to be actual useful scientific information that you could draw a real conclusion from. This is why we use ballistic gel. So what ballistic gel gives us is a medium that is repeatable, controllable, and scientific, all right? With ballistic gel, you can fire five rounds into a block of ballistic gel and then fire those same five rounds from a, you know, not the same rounds, obviously, then you can fire five identical rounds into a different block of ballistic gel and everything should perform approximately the same. That's why we use it. It's not because people are made out of jelly, although we kind of are made out of jelly. It's not because people are made out of jelly, it's because it is repeatable and controllable. So I know if I fire a bullet into a bare block of ballistic gel and it expands, that it's going to do that under those optimum circumstances. I can then create suboptimal circumstances like denim. We'll place four layers of denim over the block, fire the ballistic gel into the four layer denim, see how it, per or excuse me, fire the round into the four layer denim that's covering the ballistic gel. We can see how it performs. We can do this with a control group, 
we can measure this against previously measured rounds. We can draw meaningful conclusions from this. Then, if you're an organization like the FBI, you can take this information from your scientific testing and see how it correlates to the use in the real world. And what the FBI discovered is that rounds that perform well in their heavy clothing or the four layer denim test against ballistic gelatin perform well in real world shootings. This is where the FBI standard came from. The FBI discovered that rounds that penetrate 12 to 16 inches in ballistics gel through four layer denim or heavy clothing tend to perform well in actual gunfights in the street, okay? Again, and you can remove, when you're actually looking at that, you can remove things like psychological stops from that equation. You end up with this packet of information that says, hey, ballistic testing data performed on gel gives us this information that when applied to actual real world shootings, confirms and gives us this result. That's why you find out that 357 isn't more effective in real shootings than nine millimeter. That's how you find out that 45 ACP and 40 are basically the same thing when applied to shooting actual people. And this is interesting and it's problematic for some people because people don't like objective data that goes against their feelings. I fought against it for the longest time. I love revolvers and I wanted to believe that 357 was a death ray, that it was just a magic hammer of God, but it's not, all right? A lot of the one-shot stops that get attributed to 357 are actually psychological stops. They didn't hit the person in something that mattered. They hit them peripherally, but there was this huge flash and a loud bang and that person realized they'd been shot and they decided they didn't want to get shot anymore. Right? So it's like, you know what, I'm done. You shot me in the lung. I'm not going to die immediately, but I'm, I'm out of this fight. I'm, I'm done here, okay? And that's really what this comes down to, is everybody wants to believe in their favorite pet caliber, all right? Everybody wants to believe that X is better than Y or that, you know, 40 was the magical man stopper. And you could make an argument that with the bullet technology of 30 years ago, gosh, I don't want to think about the 80s being 30 years ago, with the bullet technology of 30 years ago that there was an argument for 40 or 45 or 357 Magnum over 9mm because they did expand and they drove bullets to slightly higher velocities to get that necessary penetration. In this modern era of outstanding bullet technology, there's no real reason to use something other than a 9mm unless you like it. And that's the thing. For personal defense, I don't care what you use. If you want to use a 40, if you want to use a 357, if you want to use a 45, that's awesome, dude. Do you do what you're going to do? Shoot what you carry what you shoot, carry what you shoot well, but don't pretend that anything that your gun does matters beyond being able to get accurate shots on target and being able to drive a bullet deep enough to hit important structures. Hopefully you'll be able to take away from this video not me stirring the caliber debate, even though that's what all of these other YouTube experts like to do, but rather to have a better, more fundamental understanding of how handgun bullets actually wound people so that the next time someone's talking about their death ray 40 or 45 or 357 SIG or whatever, you can be like, yo dog, that's that's not how handguns work. Until next time, thanks for watching, and remember, run your gun, not your mouth.